Andrew, I'm still out here. And I'm, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm right here. And I'm, we're not letting you talk. Andrew, I, um, you know, I, I sent you an email over the weekend because I saw uh, Too Big to Fail HBO replayed yeah. on, on Friday night. So maybe we should tell Steve. Steve, Wells Fargo, unless unless something was wrong in the uh, in the show, Wells Fargo never wanted any money. They didn't want any guarantees. Yeah. Wells Fargo did not want money. money. You know, stupid, stupidly though, I know that. they didn't want money. I At the time, they didn't think they <laughs> needed the money. Steve, a month later, I... they clearly needed the money. Uh, There's uh, another aspect. Uh, but wouldn't... at the time, uh, Kovacevic uh, he came in. He had no interest in the money. Uh, I don't think he appreciated, uh, frankly, how much money he knew that. would need. Okay, can I? There's another aspect of this prop trading uh, ban that sure. uh, I don't hear talked about as much, but I'm starting to hear from the buy side, which is already seeing a decline in liquidity, right. in, which is We're exactly what you'd expect. Out of our market. And, and that's a problem. That's added cost. That's lower returns for pension funds, for savers, yeah, I, for investors. Yeah, and, you know, Republican guys, presidential wanted, candidates want, need to talk about this. Yeah. Chris, I just wanted to throw out one other thing here, which is interesting to me, right. which, according on Citigroup, it says here that, that the majority of the revenue decline in 2011 was driven by the ongoing reduction in, in city holdings, which right. declined by $90 billion. I mean, just think about that. During the year, down to, they're down now to uh, 269 billion, um, and that really caused a revenue decline of 33 percent, or 6.4 billion dollars. When you think about just forget about the the business aspect of some of the operations, this is, this, there's just the asset flows that are mm. killing this business. Well, they're killing it so much they're deliberately downsizing, and the question is, what is this business going to look like a year from now? Uh, the point I've always made about Citi is that it is the most subprime of the top four banks. And to me as an investor, when you look, especially on a risk-adjusted basis, the returns available from Citi, they don't compensate you for that compared to, say, a J.P. Morgan, which I think is a more stable business, or a particularly a Wells Fargo. So, you know, this is why Warren Buffett says, hey, I like Wells Fargo. He didn't like, he liked Bank of America for a long time. Yeah. He got out because of the legacy. You know, Chris, before we let you go, we've talked about uh, the investment banks. Uh, we haven't talked about Bank of America. Right. We've now seen J.P. Morgan, Wells, and Citi. Right. Uh, any read through in terms of Bank of America, what we see here? I, I think that enterprise is still in a lot of trouble. I see them in the channel selling assets that they weren't willing to sell last year at fire sale prices, so they look to be raising cash. And I, you know, again, I'm looking for weaker revenue for the same reasons we've been talking about. Merrill, you know, is in the same position as the other banks. Chris, a quick question. Um, are these big American banks uh, exposed to Europe in a way that's dangerous for our economy, or do we not have to worry about that? Not, not in a significant way. Some of them have exposure. Morgan Stanley has exposure. City has offshore exposure. But it's not going to make or break them. I'm more worried about the lack of growth in Europe and what it does to the American economy. I yeah. think that's important. Chris, real quick, how leveraged are they to the economy? How, how much of these problems we're discussing go away if we could do 3, 3.5% three GDP growth? Well, I think it would help volumes. A lot of banks today are still running right. off. In other words, they're not writing enough loans to essentially put back on the balance sheet the loans that are coming due. So we've got to make that line move to the point where we actually have net credit growth. So, yes, if we had GDP above 3%, I think that so would be So the old fine. loans run off, and then, then right. they've got nothing to replace it with, but, but Fed... Right. Fed interest market. Well, interest. well, to that point, yes, but realize that the corporate bond sector is the only part of the, the world that's growing. working right now. Yeah. The mortgage sector is crippled, so that's our problem, is we have one leg of a three-legged stool, because governments are constrained, too. People don't want to see the U.S. deficit, the European deficit grow. So we have a problem, I think, in terms of not fixing housing is really going to hamstring U.S. economic growth. You've had a lot of people talking about this on this program and elsewhere, but nobody in Washington wants to talk about housing, you'll notice. All right, good. Thanks, uh, Chris, for joining us. Thank a new name, Tangent Capital. Good to have you and uh, a lot of helpful stuff. Yeah, Wells is actually called higher now. So yeah. uh, anyway, that, that may be it's one better. of the better reports we see. Andrew. Right. Always some interesting stuff from Chris. Uh, coming up, the headlines that we're watching this morning and then... The case for the Keystone Pipeline Congress, waiting for President Obama to decide whether to approve that pipeline. Oklahoma Congressman John Sullivan is going to join us in the next half hour with an update. But first, Greece's Prime Minister has given his first and only interview so far to CNBC. Michelle Caruso Cabrera is going to join us next with all of that and a lot, lot more right after the break.